Unlike the last two days, today I would beg your indulgence a bit more because it won't be a three to five minute summary. I want to extend by a couple of more minutes. Uh, the reason is this. So I've been thinking about the uh, causes of, let's call it miscommunication of the last few days, last two days, because of which in some senses I found and some of us found that the platform session fizzled out yesterday. So I've been thinking what exactly is happening. I'm not sure, but I should like to propose a kind of a hypothesis which I hope would structure the discussion today. Uh, so I need a little bit of, I need to do a little bit of teaching for especially people, not, not to the panel members, I, I, I apologize beforehand, but to many of us who are not familiar with these things, because if I don't explain, you won't be able to understand what I'm saying. So somewhere in the 60s, a famous historian of science one day stood in a veranda of a hot Texas afternoon in America. And he asked himself the following question. He was studying Aristotle and Newton. He asked himself the following question. How is it possible that such a brilliant mind as Aristotle appears to be so stupid when it comes to his physics? Why is it the man who insisted so much on empirical experimentation didn't even do the minimal experimentation? You know, the famous... Uh, no, he was not studying Aristotle and Newton, sorry, Aristotle and Galileo. Why is it he didn't even do the minimal experiment, which Galileo also did not do, by the way, namely, drop an object from the falling tower of Pisa? Why did he not check whether two objects of the same mass or same weight those days, when you drop them from top of a building, why did you not observe that they reached the ground at the same time? How could such a brilliant philosopher and scientist fail to see this, fail to do this? And why is it all these Aristotelians, why did they have such huge problems in understanding Galileo? So this is a question he thought about, and since then he has become famous. He died recently, I think. His name is Thomas Kuhn, a physicist, historian of science, known basically, misunderstood in fact. Most, it's typical of most of the people. When their names become famous and some term becomes famous, they're hardly read. But most often, perhaps more misquoted than and misunderstood than either properly quoted and understood, he proposed the idea that perhaps one way to understand this lack of communication between the Aristotelians and the Galileans, that is those who followed Galileo Galilei, the physicist, and Aristotle, Aristotle the Greek philosopher, could have something to do with the fact of how he put it. He put it as perhaps he said they shared different worlds. That is to say, one group could not see what the other group saw and vice versa. So he almost suggested that they lived in different worlds. Even though they were looking at the same phenomenon, they were not seeing the same phenomenon even though they were giving descriptions of what appeared to be the same phenomenon, their descriptions of the phenomenon were so different that they couldn't recognize each other's description. He called such a situation, which occurs in periods of revolution in science, he called it a paradigm change. He called this a paradigm. Paradigm is something which is, means quite a few things. It's not important for us what all those meanings are. 
paradigm, he said, is how a group of scientific theories function that became clearer later with later philosophers and historians of science, but that there is a problem of communication. From these discussions arose the idea of incommensurability of scientific theories when there's a scientific revolution, but let's not bother about that. Now, it's important to note that one does not see what the other is seeing in periods when this kind of paradigm clashes happen. But today we can, or at least we think, we understand Aristotle perfectly well. And we have puzzles in understanding why is it Aristotelians did not understand Galileo. That is because, suggested Kuhn, that actually we have no access anymore to the world of Aristotle and, and that once after the scientific revolution, or one particular theory has won, displacing the other, over a period of one or two generations, the new paradigm shapes your perception, your experience of the world. Now why do I talk about this? I don't want to compare any of us here in this panel, either to, either to Aristotelians or Galileans. I don't want to claim that some group represents Aristotelians, another group represents Galileans. That's not what I want to say. But I'm using this because this is how the notion arose. I think there is some kind of a paradigm problem here between some of us on the one side and the rest on the other. Therefore, things that we see cannot be seen by the others. But they believe it's like this, you see. Why did plants grow? Aristotelians had an answer. There's something called the dynamic entelechy, they called it. And of course, the biologists today don't make sense of the word anymore. So in that sense, whatever we are pointing out to as problems can be very trivially transformed into the description of another. To take an example, yesterday we were pointing out to some problem and Werner immediately transformed it into his kite. He says, there you are. Actually, we were not there at all. But to him it is a puzzle. How is it we don't see what he is seeing? To us the puzzle is, why is it nobody is realizing the problems we are raising? This is the first point. The second point is this. Uh, despite all these, excuse me for the sharp words, postmodernist rubbish that is so popular, especially in American universities, uh, poison which is infecting also the Indian universities, despite all postmodernist talk. See, sciences, natural sciences, are the best examples we have of human knowledge. Now people who don't know, who have not done any science, talk in terms of scientific conception, positivistic conceptions, because they don't even know the difference between a conception of science on the one side and science on the other. One and the same science, Galilean science, Newtonian science, Einsteinian science, to restrict ourselves to physics, can be interpreted in a logical positivist way, can be interpreted in a pragmatist way, can be interpreted in a Popperian way. In other words, every scientific theory can be made to support multiple philosophies of science. So the scientific conception of science is one specific, very primitive conception of science, which only social scientists hold, but no working scientist has. So today morning discussion was one such illustration. It's because it arises from a deep and fundamental ignorance of both science, whichever science it is, and a deep and fundamental ignorance of discussions and histories and philosophies of science of the last 300 years. In any case, why is, do I speak about sciences so much is because being the best examples we have of what human knowledge is, we have no better. We, there are certain lessons we should like to learn from the growth and development of these sciences the last three, four, three, four hundred, five hundred years. Which is that we learn how to try and develop knowledge about the world. Now again, how it should be done, depending on which philosophy of science you choose, you have different answers. 
collect facts and try and draw some kind of a generalization and hypothesis from it. This is the crudest, and most primitive conception of science that existed in the 16th century and this is attributed to Bacon. It's called the inductivist notion of science. Of course today, as I said today morning, nobody accepts it seriously at all, except the social scientists of course. In any case, the route we have taken is develop a hypothesis and see whether this hypothesis is able to either solve interesting problems or generate and generate new and interesting problems or if you like, can it explain phenomena? Can it bring together multiple phenomena which have different explanations into one explanation? and so on and so forth. In other words, we use criteria we have distilled from these multiple philosophies of science to test our hypothesis. And it is deliberate, this word of using a hypothesis, because this is not the truth. I mean to say, tomorrow morning, there can be a hypothesis which is better than ours. In fact, that is what scientific progress consists of. So today when we put across some idea, defend certain arguments, it's not because we think we have the absolute truth in our hands, but we say that, look, this is the best idea in the marketplace. Why is it the best? Because it answers more problems, generates more interesting problems, or explains more phenomena than anything else available in the marketplace. So like this, in other words, we should like to argue, or we'd like to suggest, that look, this is the best we can do at the moment and let's hope in, in five years time, five days time, five months time, other people will emerge with better hypotheses and do a better job. So our proposals are very, 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 very tentative, very provisional, but of course we believe that what we're saying is true. Even though we know what we say are saying cannot possibly be the truth. But this is the attitude of every single working scientist. That is, he or she proposes something, but not know, of course, believing that they're saying that what they're saying is true, but knowing that sooner or later it will be superseded by better theories. And in that sense, accepting the fact that what they're saying is not the truth. So you have to, in other words, look at what, ha what I have said in the paper in the light of these criteria. Namely, is there a well-defined problem? Or well-defined sets of problems? Is there a hypothesis with respect to the problems? Does it solve these questions in an interesting way? Does, do new questions arise because of it which are cognitively interesting and important? And does it do a better job than alternative theories? So these are the questions you have to ask to judge what we have been saying. For example, if you read the position paper, especially the third days, you know that my hypothesis about truth and falsity in India has brought together surprisingly phenomena, surprisingly different phenomena together, gives one single explanation. Not only does it account for the corruption of the judges, the judiciary, for which you need a sociological or cultural psychological explanation. It doesn't do that, it's just one and the same. It also explains such deep, deep ideas in Western law about how a law makes a people or why law is a foundation of society and how that is functioning in India, why it leads to divisiveness in India amongst the people and why, for example, that law which is supposed to check arbitrariness, which is the reason why it has come into existence, at least one of the reasons, in Western culture, generates and promotes arbitrariness and so on. In other words, it brings in phenomena from different areas, unifies them and shows there is one simple cognitive explanation possible. So, of course, any of these things you can give another description. Corruption of the judiciary, you can say it doesn't exist. You say that's also there in Europe, that's also there in the West, and you can go on and on and on like that. And in a sense, trivialize what we are doing. 
And I think that's what's happening here. Either we have failed in getting this message across or there is an inability, not an unwillingness, because all the panel members are very willing to understand, struggle to understand what we're saying, even though I don't think that what I have written is so difficult to understand. I don't make use of jargon. I keep writing plain and simple English. I identify what the problems are, what the hypotheses are. And I expect a certain kind of criticism, namely show why these questions can be answered with another hypothesis, which is better than ours. Then we can have a discussion and of course there is a resolution possible. Either our story is better than the story others present or other stories are better, in which case we'll accept them. So instead of it, what we are, ha what we are having, it appears to me, is The field of jurisprudence and philosophy of law, what is happening is this. The field of jurisprudence and philosophy of law have plowed a field for the last, well, at least three, four hundred years, if not a thousand years. Plowed it so well that fragments of our story appear to be familiar problems in contemporary law. It's very easy to say, Balo, you have a legal positivist idea of law. Yeah. I don't. It's completely irrelevant. But you can say, well, it is important because, well, that is how they have been discussing for the last, what, 60, 70 years since, uh, or oh, 100 years, since Hochfeld formulated his famous theory. So, in that sense, I think that is what is partially leading to misunderstanding. And therefore, they are unable to see, not unwilling, and intellectually definitely capable, but somehow unable to see the problems we are identifying and the solutions we are formulating. So one possible way of going about this would be to provide a better hypothesis to the problems you formulated or show why our problems are inadmissible or pseudo-problems. One possible way. And that's what I tried the first two days and it hasn't worked. The second thing is much more a positive challenge. All right, tell us then what the problems are with respect to the phenomenon we have identified, phenomenon which you have brought together. What is your solution? What are the solutions which you think are better and why are they better? So if, it, if you formulate a challenge like this to the panel members, perhaps we could go better. Because otherwise I'm afraid that we reached a dead end yesterday and there's no point in continuing down the same road. We'll be simply jump, turning around in circles. So my request to my fellow panelists and to the public then is this. Try one of the two. Either tell us why the problem formulation is wrong, pseudo, or tell us what the, what the alternative formulation of the problem is and what exactly the hypothesis is, which we can, and tell us how to test the hypothesis. We can say how this hypothesis should be tested. So tell us how to do it. How do we distinguish, how do we choose between a story which one paradigm is developing and the stories that are there in the alternate paradigm. How do we choose between these two contending, rival, competing hypotheses? This would be my request. Naomi, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you. First of all, I, since this might be my last chance to do it, I want to uh, thank Balu and all of the organizers of this conference uh, for inviting me. It's been a wonderful experience. And I also want to thank the law school and all the students who helped with this. I, I have to say I've never seen such extraordinary hospitality in anything I've attended, so I, I appreciate all of that. Um, just a couple of quick remarks on what Balu just said, and then I, I hope I'm going to try and say something that will take up his uh, comments in the spirit that he's offered them. Um, one is just to note that there is sort of a long-standing debate about whether a sort of scientific approach uh, conceding that, its power and you know, all of its accomplishments in the areas of natural sciences and so forth, whether that is the best or only way to deal with all sorts of problems. So, I mean, I think one view is we should try to be scientific in all areas of endeavor, but there's, 
the term hermeneutics, I think, often is associated with the idea that there are human aspects, you know, human questions in enterprises that don't lend themselves to, to that approach as well. I'm not taking any side in that debate or going to try and elaborate on it. I just think it should be noted that there, is, that, that there has been that sort of disagreement. The other thing that might be a slight qualification is I, I think that some of what some of the panelists have tried to do uh, has been to challenge some of the descriptions of fact that were uh, offered by Balu or in the position paper. And that, I think, is part of what he's suggesting needs to be done. Because if, there's, if the question is whether a hypothesis provides a good sort of explanation of a certain set of facts, uh, it seems like it's always fair to raise the question whether that is an accurate description of the facts. And some of the disagreement has, I think, been along those lines. So, uh, so I hope that hasn't been as uh, unresponsive to not to, to the kinds of questions that have been raised as, as may appear. But I want to set those things aside, though, and, I, and try, as I say, proceed in the spirit that's been offered. And I thought one way I might try to do it is by focusing on one thing in this third section of the position paper and then trying to generalize it in a way that will speak to, I, I think, the, uh, some of the explanations that Valo has just given. There's a whole lot in this last section. and. Um, I think it wouldn't be possible to comment on all of it, but, uh, but there was one part that I, uh, among other parts, that I thought was quite interesting, and I thought it might serve as a takeoff point. So towards the end of this section, um, the, the, the claim is made that one of the explanations for some problems in Indian law is that there isn't here any general conception of the notion of interests. That that's sort of a Western notion, and it may work or be understood well enough in the West. And it's also, uh, I think the suggestion is that uh, this is developed primarily because of the, the West religion, namely Christianity, but that there isn't any similar conception in Indian languages of an interest, and, and um, this is a difficulty. Now, when I first read this, and probably on second and third reading as well, this struck me as quite an implausible claim. You know, how, how could it be that there is not a conception of interests? Um, I thought surely there have got to be words for uh, desire or want or need or demand or goal or something like that. It's just kind of inconceivable that a language wouldn't have some way to say, you know, I want this or I need food, and that could be put in noun form. And so, so surely that, that idea has got to be translated. Then, however, upon reflection, I thought, no, maybe that I've got this wrong. Uh, would any of those words really be adequate uh, translations of the notion of interest. And uh, that question caused me to realize, or probably remember, that I think the notion of interest itself is actually very problematic in the West and, and, and in English. Um, it's a very slippery term. Uh, my own view is that it's often used, um, it's sort of rhetorically um, vague or ambiguous, and it's used in, uh, in rhetorically useful, but arguably sort of devious and even, dare I say, oppressive ways. So, so let me just give what I think is a main illustration and then see how I think this ties into the larger, the larger claim. And I, I, I hope it even leads to a constructive suggestion uh, on, the, on the main claim that Ballou just described. Um, one area where the term interest gets used a lot, I think, is in uh, attempts to implement John Stuart Mill's harm principle. And I think everybody knows the, you know, the, this is a fairly famous principle. John Stuart Mill wrote a book on liberty, and he said, you know, that government regulation of uh, restrictions of freedom should be governed by one very simple principle, as he put it, and that is, you know, basically, that there's no justification for restricting anybody's conduct unless it causes harm to others. That, I think, has been a very compelling idea in the West. Um, it's pervasive. It's used all, uh, all the time in lots of areas. Uh, it obviously raises the question, well, then what is harm? You know, and if I say, um, my neighbor is watching pornographic movies in his basement, uh, this causes me great unhappiness. Um, it frustrates my preferences. It harms me. Um, therefore, he should be prohibited from doing that. I think people in the tradition of Mill will say, that's completely wrong. That, that's exactly what we're trying to prevent with the harm principle. Your unhappiness doesn't count as a harm. But if we say, well, why not? Uh, my unhappiness can't count as a harm? Mill claimed to be utilitarian. You know, how could that possibly not count as a harm? Uh, Mill's uh, uh, disciples, I think, will often give an explanation in terms of interest. You know, they'll say, well, because the only kind of harm that counts is some sort of setting back of your interests. 
And although it may make you unhappy to think that your neighbor is doing something that you don't approve of, it doesn't in any way interfere with your interest. Well, you can see there, I think, that what's happening is that the term interest is being used in a um, very loaded way to rule out my assessment of my interest, of my happiness, and so forth, and to allow someone, the theorist, to uh, use the term of interest to, one might even say, impose on um, oppose on me, and the irony, uh, uh, actually one further point I should make, this by the way I think is not a Christian, it's not a notion of Christian origin. I, I would actually argue that the harm principle and the uh, use of interest to implement it is part of an attempt to resist and replace Christian limits on, uh, on government with, a, with a, a more secular sort of limit. So I think that's not really a Christian use. But no, the irony of what's happening is that a theory that's being offered as a way of being anti-paternalistic is actually being used in quite a paternalistic way to say, you think that your welfare you know, is, is uh, harmed in this way, but you were wrong. We know better you know, in your welfare. You know, is in, actually, you have no interest in this sort of thing. Um, now, just to generalize a little then, I might say here that the problem, it seems to me, is not that the West has an adequate conception of interest, and India doesn't. But uh, India may not. I'll take, uh, uh, I'll take Professor Balu's uh, word on that. And I would suggest that the West doesn't either. You know? um, and that is something I, that has occurred to me repeatedly during this conference, that people will often say, uh, this idea, you know, secularism or religion, it makes sense in the West, but it doesn't make sense when it's imposed in India. And I often think, no, it doesn't make sense in the West either. You know, it, it's, um, and, and this would lead to, and I'll try and be quick about this, to a view that, uh, that I want to suggest that is, I think, consistent with the sort of explanation that Balu was trying to give. But, uh, but I would offer it as a, not an uh, inconsistent hypothesis, they're not mutually exclusive, but another hypothesis that might in some ways explain certain things better than the sort of east-west uh, or west to east uh, hypothesis that I think uh, that he's working on. And it would go something like this. The west, I think, in his description uh, is Christian. And uh, he's acknowledged, I think, a number of times that the, in the modern west, uh, most people, or many people, and especially people in positions of power and people in the academy, would claim that the west is no longer really Christian, it's secular. But uh, even the secularity of the West is a product of Christianity and really still needs to be understood in terms of Christianity. And I think that's true as far as it goes. But it's also true that modern secularity is, uh, uh, while it is a product of uh, Christianity, is also in many ways a self-conscious attempt to transcend or reject to re repudiate Christianity, so that it is both sort of an implementation of, but also, uh, you might say, a rejection of, or a sort of rebellion against Christianity. And the sort of imposing then, and I'll use imposition, though that's only part of it. Someone in the panel this morning suggested that a reception, a responsive reception would be a term that would be helpful, and I think that's right too. It's not just a one-way thing, and it's not all good, you know, or all bad, and so forth. But uh, that I think is probably more pervasive in the world today and that needs to be thought about in understanding the different sorts of phenomena that we're interested in is less a Christian West imposition on the East and more of a secular modern, I'll use imposition, but interaction, let's just say, with, um, with um, we'll say, uh, more traditional elements, whether they be Christian or, or non-Christian in other parts of the world. Uh, so uh, I think very much in the spirit of his project, and not disagreeing really with uh, the potential power of his own hypothesis, the project would be improved by um, recognizing that we ought not just to think about this Christian West versus the East or versus India sort of, uh, sort of issue, but Secularism against tradition, whether it be Christian or, or, or uh, Indian, uh, sort of proposition as well. A lot of things, I think, really can be better understood in those terms, perhaps, than in just the, the West-East sort of term. 
I hope that was in the spirit of what, of what you were suggesting. <clears throat> and, and first, let, let me echo what Steve said uh, in appreciation of the tremendous hospitality that you all have shown. And it's also been an uh, interesting experience for me in many respects. This is uh, the first time I've been back to India in six years. Um, and uh, uh, all of the um, associations and the memories that I had there are coming back to me as I'm experiencing the weather and the, and the traffic and uh, even picked up a bit of a sore throat. You may hear it in my voice. Um, but also, uh, and more, most especially, the warmth of the people. So in that spirit, I want to respond to um, Balu's paper. Um, and actually, uh, in the third part, as I reread it again this morning, uh, I found very little to quibble with. Um, and I, I think it, actually, it helped me to understand a bit better some of the quite starkly drawn and chiaroscuro uh, outlines, uh, contrast that he had made in the earlier portions. Um, for example, that um, in India there is not the same concern, at least in terms of ethical performance, uh, with uh, valorizing truth in every instance. But when we get to the third section of the paper, the focus is clearly on legal procedure. And here is where I could understand him better, I think. Because in part, what he seems to be saying is that um, what Western systems of law have done in insisting on this juridical model of truth finding is an imposition that distorts the other goals that might have been sought by other means through communal institutions in India, which especially are focused not on truth merely, uh, but on something that we might, well, he uses the term reasonableness. And here I'll read that line that I so enjoyed. Um, the goal is to reach a settlement in such a way that both the disputants and the community of which they are a part can continue to live peacefully thereafter. And, and this, of course, as he points out, is not limited to India, but is found in many traditional societies. I point to uh, the work that Victor Turner has done, for example, on communal disputes in, in Africa. Um, what we find in many cases is a desire to reach an accommodation that falls short of the most violent and direct possible confrontation, which is what Western law promotes. And this is the famous notion of the litigiousness of modern Western society. And uh, as anthropologists of law have shown, uh, even the, the choice to resort to a, course of law, a court of law is something that is conditioned by all kinds of extrajudicial social sanctions. So David Engel, for example, has shown that uh, many Thai Buddhists choose not to pursue tort claims in court, even when those uh, claims can be pursued, the means of pursuing them are available, uh, because they don't think it's moral. Um, that there may be another resolution, perhaps through karma or through accommodation or through forgiveness. Um, <clears throat> now, one way in, w in which I was able to understand Balu's claim here then was to say that um, in the past, such institutions in India for resolving claims before they reach the point of outright confrontation and violence uh, associated with modern positive legal systems, such, such contexts, such systems were more robust than they are now. And in fact, they've been somewhat displaced by modern Western law. Uh, and in that sense, I think I'm entirely convinced, or at least uh, I think it's a very plausible hypothesis. Um, we know that uh, as various historians of law like Don Davis have shown, there were systems of customary law that were in place in India that were functioning on the eve of colonialism. And they may have worked very smoothly to diffuse tensions before they reached the point of maximum adversarialness. However, in what has become, uh, I think, my, the standard point that I've tried to make, uh, on all of these panels, at the same time that I accept this uh, opposition, I wanted to diffuse it to some extent. Because it's also the case that, you know, not only in India, but everywhere, and also in the West, we find, even in modern America, which is this most litigious society uh, ever, perhaps, 
we find efforts to avoid the point of going to court. Uh, and so it's a well-known statistic that um, the vast majority of criminal cases are um, actually settled out of court. Uh, civil cases, it's a very high percentage. I don't know what it is, perhaps Steve does. And, and, these, uh, and the, the increasing resort to something that's called ADR, or Alternative Dispute Resolution, in the West also shows that there are efforts to achieve a mediation between the different interests of the competing parties that is short of um, what the law provides. It's also the case that in ancient times, the resort to these methods of trial procedure was often a, a last resort. So for example, in the case of the trials by ordeal, uh, what we are told is that the ordeal is a method of proof uh, resorted to when no other is available. Uh, and, and so one way I read this paper, as I say, is a statement about the, um, the relative value or perception of the value of achieving social mediation and accommodation and even of interest, and I use the word advisedly because I also, like Steve, was not convinced by the, the claim that, that interests are not pursued by Indians through these various legal means. That there are, are, were ways of pursuing these that are not done justice to, as it were, by the imposition of Western-style legal systems. Now, that kind of left me at the point of wondering what might be done about this. And, you know, the, as, as this, uh, these panels have built up and we're now at the third and final one, um, and we've been in the mode of diagnosis, I wondered if I could at least begin to shift over to the mode, mode of prescription and ask, you know, what, if anything, can be done about this problem that Balu was identifying? Uh, because if I go to the last lines of his description, uh, he says, Laws have totally perverse goals and their effects are also equally perverse. This is as far as one can be from what law is in the Western culture. Um, now, where does that leave us? And frankly, it leaves me on the point of despair, right? I mean, I, 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 have, to, I have to say, if, 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 if this is in fact the case, um, and if in, if in fact the diagnosis, as I've attempted to outline it, is accurate, um, that the only counterpart to this adversarial system of law is robust social institutions that are capable of mediating disputes more adequately, then the question becomes, is there any opportunity for um, bringing those institutions back? Uh, and if not, should we all just throw up our hands and, uh, uh, and go home? <laughs> and uh, th this is a question I, I can't even begin to answer. So I, I simply raise it and hope that perhaps we can discuss it. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Anyone here? That yeah. Has uh, okay, uh, maybe I should apologize for thanking everybody for their hospitality. Yeah. It's been really <laughs> wonderful. Um, just to add, add my uh, sentiments to the, uh, into the basket. Um, I mean, uh, I, I have very little difficulty with this, the, this, this, the part of the paper that we're discussing today, which is the third part, because it seems to me, a, in, a, in a sense, a more generalized um, level, if you like. The, 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 on, on, the, on the first day, we were talking about truth and falsity, which was, if you like, at a very moral, in, almost individual level. Um, Yesterday we were talking about judging and institutions of courts of law and so on, and what, what tends to happen within those contexts, with a bit of overlap between the two days. And then today we're also talking about the interest that judges uh, take into account, but also other mechanisms of the state, such as the legislature. What, what, you know, what kind of interests do they take into account when making law, right? Um, and the hypothesis is that in the West, um, and, and this is maybe, I don't know if it's a resolution to Stephen your problem or or it's a kind of antagon antagonizing you further, but it, it, does it not seem that in the West, the, this idea of public interest or the interest, which starts out as the interest of the Christian community, right, or the members of the church, then in a way secularizes itself and and infuses the state, right? Isn't that 
it isn't, is, his, if we historicize it, isn't that what actually happens? So it, in a sense, re retains its religious identity while having become secularized. So, it, you know, as Balu says in, in his other writing, it kind of assumes a secular garb, but actually is still basically religious, right? Or draws on the, 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 the religious identity of different various countries. I'll leave that as a, as a hanging thing at the moment. Um, so, and if we accept that, um, then, of course, we have, we have to ask the very serious question, is that the Indian story, right? Uh, because, of course, we don't have a, of course, there are Christian communities, but largely there is no Christian community in a, in a place like India um, for large sections of its history and certainly hasn't had a predominating role until the colonial state comes in, right? Then we have to ask quite serious questions about what, what interest did the colonial state think it was pursuing, right? And of course, in a very general way, we can say, in, in a secular sense, it was actually trying to reform its, the Indian subjects, right? And so it was certainly pursuing some type of secularized idea of public interest, right? What it saw in, as being in the interests of Indians at large, its colonial population, right? Um, so in, in a sense, it, was, it, was, it seems, this is of course a very partial reading of history and so on, and there are more people who are better qualified to ask these questions, but, or answer these questions, um, th there is still this idea of state interest within the colonial state, right, or public interest within the colonial state, and that idea is one of reform, I can suggest. Um, but once the colonial state, if you like, well, once the colonialists evacuate, right, what takes over in its place, right? Uh, what, what is the logic or what is the underlying idea that informs the operation of the Indian state in the post-colonial period? That's the question, I suppose, which is at the heart of this problem, right? Is there a coherent nation, notion of public interest at large? And I, I think Balu's, Balu's hypothesis here is that, actually, no, it's an ag aggregation, if one can even call it that, of a multiplicity of personal interests and sectional interests, right? Um, and I find this, this kind of hypothesis is quite productive because of course I explained earlier that I'm in, in quite interested in questions of cultural diversity and so on in the, on, in the European scene. And you find that claims to uh, alterity, uh, claim multi, uh, you know, claims uh, on, on the basis of multiculturalism within Western uh, countries all, are always made subject to the larger public interest. Right? And Balu's take here is that the sectional interest that appear to raise their uh, head in terms of legislative initiatives in, in, in the context of India don't actually share that kind of nature. So, so actually they become quite, uh, they end up having quite dysfunctional effects and he gives several examples, right? So, and, and various writers have actually pointed to the fact that let's say gender is at the forefront of the lawmaking agenda in, in India today. Right? But if you, if, if you look at the effects of the gender-related legislation, the uh, you know, so-assumed pro-women legislation in India, it actually has massively dysfunctional effects. I, I had the opportunity to examine one of uh, Werner Mensky's PhD students a, a few months ago, um, and he did, he did a, a, a study in various uh, urban centers in India, right? uh, Robin Wyatt's study, um, of uh, dowry litigation. And, and he actually found out that the, dow the claims of dowry were a cover for marital problems, right? Primarily, uh, in the large majority of cases, there may have been some uh, dowry-related issues as well. But the, the 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 driving force here, yeah, was ma uh, antagonism between the married parties, right? Something which they had failed to resolve, and that the f something that the families had uh, failed to resolve. So you see a massive driver of personal interest, which infests the legal system in this way. And it seems to me that it's actually very hard to harness some kind of coherent idea of public interest as for judges to be able to mediate these ideas. Um, but then you get the silent creeping in, I think the argument was, yeah, of Hindu concepts of, yeah, harmony in the family and resolution and, yeah, go home and make it work, that sort of stuff, right? Uh, but this is all very personal, yeah? Uh, to, at which point does it become public, right? Um, so I can see that there's something in the paper that we need to explore further, I would suggest, right? There is some real problem here. Yeah. I've come here because I was fascinated by what I knew about your work. And uh, I've seen that the paper here indicated certain positions that I could see very quickly I could not agree with. So you've invited me to either challenge or whatever. Um, 
And what I've heard now over the last two years and what I'm he two, two days and what I'm hearing today, um, I think confirms something for me. Um, we're here to rethink religion in India. We are being asked to put together religion and culture and law. We are asked, we are tasked with yeah, being um, aware of the fact that these various phenomena all around us interact, conflict, compete, cause whatever distortions, whoever distorts whom or what. And I have come to the conclusion, certainly while I was listening to you earlier, that I think you are, or your approach here, is doing something which is absolutely fascinating, but it's totally wrong, or misguided, let me put it that way. You're basically, or this approach that you're putting to us, um, is basically doing what Professor Hart, many years ago, did when he talked about the concept of law. Hart's concept of law was designed to challenge Austin from the 19th century, because Austin's concept of law was that law is the command of the sovereign. And Hart's approach was, no, that is clearly not good enough. Yeah? Um, law is something different. Law needs to be applied in a social context. And Hart identified as this social context the group, if you like, the category of officials. All right? So he engages, I've warned us all before about this, he engages in a partial theorizing of the concept of law by examining what yesterday I showed you as corner three, the state corner of law, and shows how the state corner of law itself is a plural entity in which certain powers play themselves out between legislature, judiciary, functionaries of the state, and so on, to construct operative legal systems. Hart is clearly a positivist. Lord Balu, and I'm calling you Lord Balu overnight because I've had sleepless nights here thinking about my responses. Lord Balu demands answers. And my answer is here that you are doing what Hart is doing because you are claiming you're not a positivist, but you are. Your perspective is very much, this is my view of law, Western law. This is what it does. And I think very gently my co-panelists have begun to indicate that maybe there is law and law, and there is diversity within the definition of what law actually is. So yes, I could see immediately what is happening here is we are presented with a dualistic, in a sense, um, scenario in which the coming together of Western legal tradition or traditions on the one hand and the presence and operation of whatever local traditions and processes we have here causes distortions, causes problems, causes corruption, whatever you want to say. That's almost trivial. And so I thought, okay, of course, I know that. I know Indian law is a mess. After all, I'm the only Western professor of Indian law. There is no other person. You have lots of people here doing Indian law, but there's nobody else in the West. Now, I thought you had called me here as a resource person to talk about Indian law, but we are constantly talking about our concepts of Christianity, Western law, all these types of things. So my question here is now, if we realize, and I totally agree with you, there's a mess here. There is a m 
huge distortion. But who distorts who? What distorts what? And how do we get out mm. of this mess? I mean, I'm writing now about law as a sophisticated mess. That's not very constructive, yeah? And so I think we are also here on this panel, in this panel discussions, reaching no other conclusion that we say, right, there is a sophisticated mess here, and maybe you wanted us to identify whether one can construct a research project or research projects to work on the presence of this and the manifestations of this sophisticated mess. If that is your agenda, because you're also playing the role of saying it's not this, it's not this, it's not this, you're doing niti, 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 but you're not telling us what is it that we ought to be doing. Yeah? If the, the aim is to construct research agenda, then yes, definitely. But this research cannot be done by philosophers. It needs to be done by lawyers, by legal scholars. Now the big difficulty I have and see is that Indian legal education is just not ready for this kind of challenge. Because the way in which young law students are taught here, and we're looking at the next generation and the next generation, they are not being equipped with the tools to handle these kinds of challenges in an analytical fashion, very clearly. And one of the reasons for this is, shall I tell you, that heart is God in India. I went to the National Law School about 10 years ago in Bangalore, and uh, at that time, uh, Mohan Gopal was director, and it was the first day of a new study year. And Mohan said, come on, you're here, just lecture to these new people, come on. So I talked about Hart's concept of law. And <laughs> it caused a bit of, uh, well, surprise, let's put it that way. Because Hart claims, and this is why I'm saying you're doing a heart on us, Hart claims that primitive people do not have law. If you don't believe it, check him out. The guys in Bangalore didn't believe it. They said, okay, read your heart overnight. They came back next morning and said, sorry, sorry. Okay, so what's happening? the presumption that the West has certain things which do not exist elsewhere may be right, but it's also in many situations very much questionable. Hart was wrong in asserting that primitive people do not have law because he based his assertion on the argument that they did not have officials. His concept of law, remember, is, no? There is a state with functionaries, with officials, and so on. Hart was too blind, I'm not saying you're blind, yeah? but Hart was too blind to see that Africans, Indians, whoever, lots of people in the world, have officials that maybe don't draw a salary or something like that, and have no official contracts, but they exercise the functions of officials of the law. They're engaged in negotiation of legal processes. They help in dispute resolution. Yeah? They informally do all sorts of things. And I think whether we talk about religion or law, we constantly face this fuzzy boundary, as I call it. And if that's postmodernism, so be it. Yeah? But it's not, for me, postmodernism. Maybe I should say I'm a Jain. You know, I take this Anikanta Vada concept probably to its modern manifestations because I was taught by a Jain professor when I started all these things. Yeah? So I don't accept as a matter of my practice, if you like, that there is this and that, that there is white and black. There are all shades of white and black in between. And then obviously I have to be some sort of pluralist. And you can see, in certain contexts, that then results in 
some turbulence of the kite or whatever you want to call it, some um, possibilities of misunderstanding. So if life is complex and plural, law cannot be just as simple as heart made it out to be, very clear, okay? So I have described in 2006 heart as a, a closet pluralist, if you like, a pluralist who did not want to admit that he is a legal pluralist because it wasn't fashionable in the 60s, obviously. But it isn't even fashionable today. I think you heard it a moment ago. One gets accused of being postmodern or trivial or just descriptive or something like that. It is a really tricky place to be in to study the pluralities of legal systems that we see all around the world. The trouble is to understand this plurality, we have to be interdisciplinary. We have to be aware that law is not just law. Law is about power, therefore it's about politics. It's about economics and all sorts of interests. And for you to argue that the Indian tradition does not have a concept of interest, I'm sorry, is entirely misguided. Of course there isn't a word interest, but there are other words that clearly indicate this. And I would suggest even the most basic term, dharma itself, is a manifestation of interest because it is at the same time interest in the individual's existence and continuation, as well as an interest in the link that that individual has with groups, with the state in whatever form, and with the whole universe, because we are operating in some sort of global context there as well. So to argue that a particular tradition doesn't have a particular concept that is prominent in another context does not make sense to me, I'm afraid. So yes, I disagree. But I believe that your project, what I believe your project intends to do is absolutely terribly important. But how do we motivate those people here in India who are law scholars to take part in this kind of exercise? Social legal studies in India are virtually dead. People study IPR, criminal law, all sorts of things to go into practice. They want jobs in New York if they go to the big law schools. Yeah. Nobody wants to be a law teacher, it looks like. And so, you know, where is the future for Indian legal education? And where is the future for cooperating with people from other disciplines, such as philosophy, such as, you know, other academic subjects that we have, to bring this forward? What I find sad, I've been in this now for what, 35 years, I'm going to retire next year. Um, what I see is, in those 35 years, a lot has happened, but also the mess, the messiness, has become more intense. Prakash indicated that. So yes, we have learned to build gender concerns into Indian law. Wahida is struggling with this for South Africa. Yeah? The South Africans are learning to be more gender conscious, to take all these things into account. But it causes new problems as well. It doesn't necessarily just give an easy solution. That's it. Yeah? You make a law, it's a piecemeal thing, we know it, it causes some trouble. Yeah? How any one big research project can address these kinds of complexities, I fail to understand. How one can bring a group of people together to work on this, long term, obviously depends on public funding or whatever, yeah? It's a huge resource issue as well. I think the paper here has done a brilliant job to put the challenge before us in all its depressing complexity. But I think none of us here has any solution for how to go forward. And this is depressing in a sense. So I think we ought to go back to you and maybe we ought to hear from you, how, how should we go forward? What do you maybe see as the scope for going forward? Yeah? It is an enormous, very dramatically depressive scenario. And yet India prospers 
okay, there's corruption. Your government is strange at the moment. Yeah? But I said two days ago, the critical issue in the Indian legal management is the balance between Entstaatlichung in German and Verstaatlichung. So more state and less state. If your people here, your Hartian officials, right, don't get that balance right and exploit their people rather than acting in the public interest, you're going to die as a nation. You're going to have revolutions and so on. And if I may, a little extra word on interest. Again, what do we learn about public interest law in India? There are books on this subject. Every single book will tell you that this is borrowed from the USA. What a nonsense, right? What a nice fiction. And it, can you see, it follows from your presumption that the Indian system does not have a concept of interest. Yeah? Hindu law does not have a concept of public interest. Really? I've spoken to Krishna Iyer, one of the pioneers of this public interest litigation. What does he say? Menskiji, if I had talked about Hindu law when we judges devised the cases, the early cases, the pioneering cases on public interest, everybody would have laughed. So what did we do? We cited American law. This is the acceptable, the politically correct, if you like, the globally correct method of flying kites, right? Now that's not postmodern, that is present. This is the present challenge to handle these diversities. And so a resourceful judiciary is not arbitrary as you assert, yeah? It is extremely skillful to try and manage these challenges because you know, at least if you're lawyers here, what do you do if you sit in jail and you shouldn't be in jail because it's illegal that you're in jail? Yeah? The Supreme Court said, write us a postcard from jail and you can file your case. We will file your case in court. Can you see? You don't need a lawyer. You don't need to pay. You have automatic access to court. Does this happen anywhere else? No. So India leads the world. You don't even realize this. Leads the world in these kinds of techniques to manage a sophisticated mess. And then we are sitting here and saying, oh, it's so bad, it's so corrupt, yeah? I'm sorry, yes, it is so corrupt, but at the same time, it is also magically somehow functioning. I think we need to research how it comes that it actually functions, rather than to try and see why certain things do not work. So how does a mess function? Yeah, and why does a mess function? I don't know, yeah? Where to begin? I've done some work on this, and then you find your book is not even in this library here. Well, too bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so, I, I disagree with your premises, largely. Yes, I see the sign. Please stop soon, I will. Um, very gentle. Um, I disagree with your premises because my experience of how Indian law works um, tells me that the contrast between Western methods and Western styles and Western thinking about how law operates and whatever is on the other side, and it's not just Hindu, we know that. I said it earlier today. Yeah? If it wasn't for the presence of Muslims and other minorities, Indian law would not be what it is today. Very clear, yeah? But the combination of these not quite matching elements, that is what we need to research. But how to do it, that's for the next generation. That's for you young people here. Can you see there is so much to do for everyone in the room here? And please let me retire. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Let me first by agreeing with Werner. He's absolutely right on two things. About the nature of legal education, 
I think it's absolutely, absolutely right on the spot. There's something very badly wrong, we need to do something about it. Not just something, something very urgently. He's also right when he says that what I'm asking for is a huge research project. Yeah, true, for projects. As for other things like I'm a heartian and so on, I don't mind. I mean, it's, it's, it's his way of looking at the world. It's not my way of looking at it. So I've read Heart, I'm not in the least impressed by the guy. I mean, that's 20, 20, 15 years ago. So maybe I'm a heartian, Lord Balu. Let's see where it takes me. So it's okay, we'll continue. That means we have a, a possibility of continuing the conversation further. And you know, whether I can disagree with him, call him postmodern. I didn't mean it, but he thinks I'm calling him a postmodern. I don't think you're postmodern at all, Werner. You don't have any of the traits of postmoderns or of a postcolonial. Ah, German. I uh, see, this is where I was waiting for that. You I'm would, a German. You would not find a British person sitting here, a white British person. This guy's British, I think. Yeah, German, Germans are everywhere, are they not? Yeah. Good. No, no. He's, he's neither. So when I spoke of postmodern, postcolonial, I didn't have any of the panelists in mind at all. In fact, I had no particular person in mind. Uh, see, we can't simply. Okay, let's assume. Whatever, however you want to call it. See, I'm not mourning or saying things are bad in India, look how much corruption we have and so on. Actually, I'm simply showing how my explanation brings these facts together, why it makes it understandable and not simply morally judge it. But besides that, see, of course, including me, all the panelists here have the freedom to say, okay, guys, we don't know what to do. We'll, we, anyway, next day we are going home. But this is not a luxury Indians have, do they? You have to do something about it. How, and this is my hope, is that we begin questioning in certain ways we are not used to questioning. I perfectly understand Werner's point of view. Like, look, let, let's take one, one simple example. It's on the one hand something to say. All societies have dispute settling processes. Define, call that law and say every state, every country has a law, every group has a law, every culture has had a law. So Indians also have law. True, if you want to call it that, we have no objections. Yeah, we also have it. So you want to say every culture in that sense has religion, religion is whatever they think is okay. India also has religion. But this is the story against which my story stands. Namely, there are different ways of being different. For example, I'm beginning to wonder whether, and I'll come back to it in a minute, what sociologists, and even I was a Marxist many years ago, claim about existence of social classes as absolutely necessary for the existence of society. I'm wondering how much of it is true. The longer I stay in Europe, the more I realize how European the idea is. Not Christian, how European. Let me link it to one point and then I'll end there. But the notion of interests. Uh, Steve is right. There is something very paternalistic about it. But it's because the idea is paternalistic. God came and revealed the true interests of man, which is salvation. That was distinct from what he felt to be, namely follow the temptations of Satan, of the, of the Lord of Earth. From there, the notion of interest arises. Then there's the notion of institutional interest of the Catholic Church, of Ecclesia, of the Christian community, and so on and so forth. So what John Stuart Mill and others do is speak in that language and try and secularize it, but they have to talk the way the priest talked. He knows what is in your true interest to do. Now when I say we don't have, of course we have words for desire. We don't have a word for need, we have a word for desire, of course. From that it doesn't follow anything about interest. And this is, just think of it, the rhetoric of America since Second World War. Anything it does is in the interest of the American nation. It is in American interest, whether it involves bombing Afghanistan, going to war in Iraq, hanging Saddam Hussein. Everything is in the American interest, isn't it? What do we understand? What exactly are these American interests? The population is inundated with it. You must have listened to the debates between Barack Obama and Matt Rumney. 
They were only talking only about interests of the American people. The British did it. They spoke about policies in India and they defended it in the name of the interests of the empire which was against the interests of the British nation. We have words for it. We have translated words for it. We have enough of them. We have a translated word for vested interest. In Kannada we call them Pattabhadra Hitasakti and in Kannada we call it interest Hitasakti but we don't know what the hell it means. What, for example, is in the interest of the Indian people? I really challenge any one of you Indians to answer the question, if you understand the question. So maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's a deep word which none of us knows. In that case, there's no point the word, the word exists in some Sanskrit text or not. Point is, it is not part of vocabulary. I'm trying to figure out why it is not. So in post-colonial talks about public interest and private interest, public interest litigation, what is public interest? Well, anything what? Cutting down a tree is in public interest. How, how, how is it in public interest actually? What makes it in public interest? We have no idea. Now, it is true. It is true. The notion of interest is very slippery in the Western philosophy, Western intellectual tradition. Absolutely right. But that does not prevent them from using the word constantly for 2000 years, does it? And that comes from Christianity secularized itself. True, for example, enlightenment people fought religion. But you know how they did it? They used all the arguments of the Protestants in a secular fashion. The enlightenment, the ch children of reason were disguised theists. They were not atheists at all. I have shown that. So I have a different take on the Western history. I'm developing one. The more I read, and I don't have the classical conception of Western law. This is not the idea of a philosopher. In fact, I told you this document arose because I started studying law. I am pre I'm preparing dossiers for prosecuting some people in the criminal court. And I'm glad to report that the best criminal lawyers in Belgium have asked me to come and work for them after my retirement. Because I make very good legal documents. So I'm not speaking as a philosopher at all. On the contrary. These ideas didn't occur to me as a philosopher. It's only when I started working with law, I had problems with it, I began to go deeper and deeper and dig deeper and deeper into the history of the growth of European law. Went not in terms of, went not just to, I went to all kinds of legal historians. So I'm not really uh, persuaded that I'm all that wrong. Maybe I'm wrong, I have no idea. But one thing I can tell you, this avenue seems very promising to me. Because the question arises, if there are no interests which are anthropological needs of human beings, as Christianity claims, does there exist a state in India? Could a state exist without a class, without the interest? Could social classes exist in India? Could classes exist without having a class interest? If they do not, here is the beauty of it we can for the first time begin to give a political analysis of India in a way that has not been done anywhere because all the political analyses that we have of India are third rate, they tell us nothing, they make us understand nothing. So-called World Bank politics is a word that was coined by, by a journalist during Indira Gandhi's time and has become a scientific philosophical term today. This is the level of political science. So if my proposal will have some merits, we won't see it today, we'll see it over a period of time. It is going to provide us with very concrete analyses of politics and sociology, law, society, and culture in India, and not just in India, of the Western culture as well. It's possible, as Werner puts it, I'm misguided. But then as Naomi cited my book, there is wrong and there is wrong. It's better to be wrong in interesting ways than peddle barren ideas which everyone thinks is right for the wrong reasons. I thank you. All of us have talked a little bit about interest today, and Prakash asked, um, uh, directed uh, some good questions at me. Um, so, uh, although this may for some of you be not the central issue that we've talked about, I think there's been some exchange between Balo and, and Werner on some of, some of the more gutsy issues, so, so maybe it wouldn't be inappropriate to try and answer Prakash's question a little and uh, say something a bit more about interest. Um, I think I agree with everything that Balu just said on this point as far as it goes, 
my suggestion has just been that there's sort of a two-way movement here and that a better understanding comes from recognizing that. So, so maybe just uh, let me try and put it this way. See if this, I, I've just been thinking about this, by the way, sitting here. This isn't something worked out in advance. I take it that probably, er, let's start with individual interests. Um, I take it that probably every human being who has ever lived has had certain wants. You know, I want this, I want that, and so forth. Um, it's also true, I take it, that any moral system or religion that has an ethical or moral sort of component will often be in the business of telling individuals some of the things that you want you should not have, you know, you, you should not pursue. Uh, so, some of them are fine, but others, you know, that you think you want um, you know, are forbidden or whatever, you know, they, they would be immoral. So you should. If, if, if we want to express that, we could use the term interest or a concept like that to do it. You could say some of the things that you want are in your interest. Other things you may want, but they're not in your interest. Um, they would not be good for you in some sense. Uh, I think it's surely true that Christianity like other religions and moral systems, has done that. And so one could certainly say that in the history of the West, Christianity generated a certain kind of concept of interest, still thinking about this on the individual level. As Christianity gets cast off, or at least as certain sections of the population attempt to and believe that they have sort of cast off Christianity, it's true that, that they have to still do something similar. So Mill and his disciples do something similar to that. And um, I, I, I believe in the way I tried to explain earlier. And I think it's perfectly fair to say, as I think Prakash and Balu both said, that you could say, see that in a sense, this is an extension then of the sort of Christian view, although it wasn't really uniquely Christian to start with. But, uh, but still, in, in Western history, this could be seen as an extension of the Christian of the Christian view. And, and so I think that's a fair description. I think it's also important to note, however, that the attempt to cast off the Christian sort of dimension to this and to do the same thing without using Christianity is itself a problem. You know, there are, if we wanted to say, maybe distortions or communication problems that occur in trying to do that as well. Those sorts of again, translation or distortion or communication issues might be, in some context, as important to understanding certain problems that we see arising as it is to recognize that there was a Christian origin and dimension to some of this. It might be more important to recognize that there's an anti or non-Christian dimension to some of this and that that's causing so, so, some of the problems. Again, in other words, this would be the secular versus the whatever you want to say, traditional or classical this sort of uh, hypothesis that arguably would do some explanation. Now, if we come to public interest or common good or something of that sort, then I take it that it's also true that in the history of the West, uh, there was a notion of the common good or the public interest and that this had a very heavily Christian dimension to it. So this natural law thinkers like Thomas Aquinas, you know, there's constant references to the common good or the public, well, common good, but, you know, we, we could say the public interest probably. And, uh, and that this has a Christian dimension to it. Now what happens in modern times as you cast off the sort of Christian explanation of the common good? Um, and my own view is something like this. There are some thinkers who would say, now we can only understand that in terms of an aggregate of the individual goods or individual interests, something like that. Uh, or for certain kinds of goods, perhaps like health or the common defense, interests that every individual has. You know, so, so, so something like a universal individual interest or an aggregate of the common good. And certain people, in the, especially in like the law and economic sort of mode, I think are perfectly happy to understand uh, public interest or the common good in that way. But if you don't want to do that, you say, no, that isn't what we mean by common good. And we're not going to rely on any Christian notion of it. Then um, what do you do? And I think you have a big <coughs> emptiness there, you know, a, a sort of a gap, an inability to understand. That, that, so the language of public interest may persist, but it's very difficult to give any very good account of what that might mean what that might mean. And this is a problem in the West, I think. And it's a problem not of the Western imposition of Christianity on a foreign culture. It's a problem of the Western attempt to reject Christianity and still go on doing things that arguably do have their origins in Christian practices. At that point, that may then also be then imported into other cultures, like India. And that may be the source of the problem. Um, 
more than, it would be more fair to say that that's the source of a certain kind of problem than it would be to say that the problem is the imposition of a Christian notion of the public interest on, on another culture. So I'm just suggesting that that's a hypothesis worth exploring as well. Sometimes that may have more explanatory power than the sort of uni unified view of the Christian West uh, hypothesis would have. Uh, just, to, just to say something, Steve. This is called, this is a hypothesis which you'll read in Heathen called secularization of religion. Mm -hmm. What the problem you're talking about. So when we say Christian, we're not talking about imposition of Christianity on India. I have not used that word at all anywhere, either in my talk or in my writings. Christian ideas have secularized themselves, pretend to be free of theological foundations, but with us as theological background framework, they do not make sense, which is something you also yourself write about. So indeed, secular ideas create a lot of problems. Secular means secularized religious ideas. So when I speak about Christianity, all I'm pointing out is the theological origin to what appears today, what we have borrowed as secular ideas. Yeah, to that extent, I think we agree. Yeah. I want to say a little bit on the question of interest because I had written down that one of the crucial questions that wasn't really raised in Balu's uh, position paper for today was the distinction between group and individual interests. He does, of course, talk about uh, how in, in contemporary India, different, different uh, tribal factions assert their interests, but there wasn't enough context for that, I think, in his uh, prefacing discussion about what interest means in the West. Because I think to understand that, uh, it's, it's terribly important to understand um, that interest is an individually expressed concept and that the legal system supports that. And the way in which, uh, for example, a, a cause of action is brought is on individual initiative in the main. And then, and, and then of course, we have the formation of, of classes and litigation, but that that itself encourages a certain model of interest that is also expressed. And here's another word we didn't really use that much today that intersects with interest is rights. And, and that notion does have some kind of history in Christianity, but I would submit that actually, as we have it now, it has much more to do with enlightenment and this notion of the, the separateness of the individual. Now, we, we could accept perhaps Balu's argument that he made on the first day that human rights are essentially Christian, um, and, that, and that therefore the, the notion of the individual, in fact, is implicated in a particular kind of Christian theology. Um, but however, um, the point is that it is that model of individualistic interest that I think is in competition with the notion of group interest. And so everywhere that we see these kinds of controversies playing out, the question is, you know, um, pluralism versus um, what the state allows is the sole source of law. And when, when I was talking earlier about what's the alternative to having this kind of juridical model where everything becomes adversarial, and by the way, adversarial uh, based upon the competition of these two self-identified individual parties, even if they're defined as classes, the, the alternative to that is some kind of group mediation, right, that occurs as it were, and I, I would argue that it's always occurring anyway, right, when people decide not to go to court there's a group that's influenced, Prakash made that point also about resolving things within the Hindu family. Um, so that is there. And, and often we, in fact, do want people to do, go to court and be adversarial um, because we might think that their rights, in fact, won't be satisfactorily achieved within the unit of the family. So we have to acknowledge that as well. I don't want to suggest that uh, groups getting along and group sanctions are always and ever the preferable alternative to this. But it's this model of individual rights versus versus group rights that could be effectively acknowledged with some kind of legal pluralism that, that I think is, is really in part at the heart of all of this. And I, I don't know quite how to resolve that. I think that, that we've had great difficulty in, in doing this. But if, if you could have somehow robust extrajudicial institutions that would work effectively in conjunction with that adversarial model that's implicated in the court, then you would, you would have squared the circle. Then you would have the golden mean. But, uh, but I, I don't see how that can be done under present circumstances. If I may just, just add one last point. I mean, it's just an additional detail, really. But I think it's a, it's a little bit instructive in the sense that, and Werner and other, others have, have actually pointed to this in their writing, 
the in the in the days before prior to colonization the indian state or the hindu raja was not a legislator right and that tells us a lot that tells us that actually there was no real basis for enacting general laws of the type that were already beginning to be used in europe to a large degree degree after the gregorian reform right um i mean I just want to ask the question, what does that tell us? But I think it tells us something very important. Yeah. Uh, and, and goes to the heart of what, what Balu says uh, about the nature of the state. Right? It calls into question what the Indian state is really doing. What is it there for, in a way? Uh, does anybody know? <laughs> okay, thanks. Are there, see, there's something very interesting, just an empirical fact. If you look at the programs, that Indian states have, have implemented, where the central government, not Indian state, Indian governments, so the central governments are different state governments. It's very interesting to see all their programs have to do with what we call charity programs. Uh, giving sarish to widows, giving free food, uh, giving bicycles, uh, giving free books, go on and on and on and on. I'm doing a study of it. You just get charity programs. Indian governments have no other conception of governing. This is what is going on, which is something unthinkable in Europe or America. Only charity programs. I'll stop there. And not even charity programs, but self-interested programs that look like look, charity yeah, programs. Program yeah, because they want, they want votes or whatever. Yeah? Um, but the point that Prakash made about Raja Dharma and all that. Um, I think what we need as well as part of this project is a new study um, on how the Indian constitution actually reflects these older concepts because you cannot read the in Indian constitution as uh, a blueprint or something of the American Constitution. It is a very different type of argument, yeah, of, of document. And I think I said yesterday or the day before that um, if one looks, for example, just at Article 38, no? as I cited, the state shall uh, create all sorts of conditions as effectively as it may. Can you see there's a clear recognition of limits of what the state can do? Yeah. And it does not try to lay down all sorts of things. Uh, one could go on forever. But, but we can. Yeah, we can. <laughs> Quite. We'll do so. Uh, we'll do so later. <laughs> okay. Thank you. There's a tea break now, and I'll see you all back here in 15 well, minutes. Yeah, Thank so you, panel. Would, would you yeah. be one? Yeah. 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 Let me think about this. Oh, okay. I have a coffee and a cigarette, and then I should think of something. Do you want something?